Hi there, my name is David Kenny. Welcome to our program, Light from Above. I'm the preacher for the Church of Christ on West Good Avenue in Wadsworth, Ohio. Glad you could tune in. We're continuing our series of lessons about a New Testament Christian, and these are based on the lectureships at the Memphis School of Preaching. And I picked this photograph, this is sort of as an introduction photograph, because I'm looking down from the second story of the M.B. Hardeman Library, and I'm actually looking down upon a big display case uh, that's on the main floor. And as I was taking the picture, I was getting a little dizzy uh, trying to make sure that I was maintaining my balance while I got that photograph. And that's what we're talking about in this lesson, the importance about having balance. In the lectureship book, Brother Lemons makes this observation about balance. He says that the New Testament Christians are called upon by Scripture to live lives that are balanced. It is not an easy thing to remain balanced in following the Savior's example and being guided by the inspired scriptures. It is the delight of Satan to cause Christians to be unbalanced or out of balance as he hurls his fiery darts towards them. Satan's challenge must be used as motivation for faithful Christians to seek with great zeal to be balanced. Now, you know, I, I do a lot of reading and I try to keep up the best I can with Brotherhood journals and bulletins and things like that. There's so much to read. And, and, and so I, I try to be very careful about making broad brush kind of statements because I, 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 I don't know everything about it and I don't know, you know, I'm not able to keep up with everything that's out there. But it doesn't take a lot to come to the realization that there's a lot of attacks against Christianity and against the church from all quarters. Uh, and, and so to try to maintain a balance is something that's very difficult. And one of the things that you know, I come across, you know, here in our area is the idea, you know, some people have this idea that, you know, the only problem that we may have is people are taken away from the scriptures. They're ignoring the scriptures. But, you know, you may not realize, or people may not realize, it's just as wrong to add to the scriptures. Now, notice this passage. This is Revelation chapter 22, 18 through 19. It says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Now, some people, you know, they say, well, you know what, he's talking about just revelation there. But, you know, you go and you look through the Bible, and you'll find similar kinds of warnings. We are not to add or subtract from the Word of God. We are supposed to be balanced, and we are supposed to be scriptural. And some people, you know, they don't realize that, you know, subtracting is one thing, but some people like to add. And so both of those things can throw us off balance. So I thought we'd go over some suggestions on how to maintain your balance as a Christian. And I have six of them, and here are the six that we're going to take a look at. Uh, one does not substitute weights. Two, knows Jesus as personification of balance. Three, walks in the light as he is in the light. Four, abide in the doctrine of Christ. Five, run the race with endurance. And six, remember the standard of judgment. Now, the first one there, number one, don't, you know, don't accept substitutes. You know, we're talking about, you know, a scale kind of thing. You know, scales, the old-fashioned scales, uh, you know, you had to have, you had your standard over here, and then you would put things on it. And then once it was balanced, then you knew that this equaled that. Well, we're in the same kind of discussion here. here here's, what we're, here's what we're balancing. You know, we're balancing the Word of God and, and ourselves. And we're constantly making these adjustments. And, and we need to think about that. Now, this has been warned about in the physical sense for a long time. Look at this passage in Leviticus chapter 19, 36. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so, you know, a lot of people, they substitute. You know, they don't want to put the Bible on there. You know, they may put other things on there. They may put the, like the Book of Mormon. They might put the Koran. They might put the Catechism. They might be a church manual. It might be their opinions. It might be secularism. It might be humanism, uh, atheism. You know, they, they substitute the weights. But if we're going to have, as New Testament Christians, a balanced life, we can't substitute the Word of God for some other object, some other weight. So that's the first one. Don't set, accept substitutes. 
Well, number three, or excuse me, number two is, no, Jesus is the personification of balance. You know, a lot of people are critical of Jesus. They don't uh, really, you know, they, they try to ignore religion. They're trying to push religion out of our society. And societies are becoming out of balance. Matter of fact, in, in our town, uh, there's a big concern about heroin overdose. And people are talking about that, which, you know, is definitely great that they're raising awareness. But what's the prescription for it? Ideally, you want to get a hold of people before they even get involved in heroin because it's so highly addictive. But once they do, you know, the solution's the same. And that solution is Jesus. Jesus is the personification of balance. Jesus said the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You know, we have a group in that's, you know, sort of given our city some trouble about uh, praying about this situation because of the location of the prayer. It's interesting that same group that's giving the city trouble is also advocating the legalization of marijuana in the state of Ohio. And I'm like, does that, does people not realize that you keep pushing Jesus out and something's coming in? And in a society, some people are saying we need more secularism. We need more, you know, let's, let's bring pot in. Uh, let's bring gambling in. Let's bring process, you know, all these different things they want to bring in. And what happens to our society? It becomes out of balance. What happens to people? You see, Jesus and his word brings balance. And our society's learning a very hard lesson. And I'm afraid that we're going to learn it even more severely if people don't wise up. Because there are people out there that are willing to take a stand against God and morality. And it's going to take righteous people to stand up and say, enough is enough. We are not doing that. You're hurting society by advocating these things, these sexual immorality, drug use. We're going to have major problems. And they're going to get worse until people are willing to go back and come to the realization that Jesus and his word brings life, an abundant life. If you want to have balance, you need to recognize that. Well, number three relates to that. If you want to have balance, we have to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. Now, there's a benefit to that. The passage in 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, notice that here, you know, we're talking about fellowship and getting along. Well, if we all follow Jesus, if we all walked in the light, we would have that fellowship. It would be so much better. But some people, they resist that. They don't want that. And so they substitute things. And they refuse to walk after his standards. And what happens? Well, they come out of balance. But if we would walk in the light of God's word, if we'd follow Jesus' example, and Jesus teaching, we would be in the light, and he would cleanse us of our sins. We're not alone as Christians. And God is there. Jesus is there. His word is there. The Holy Spirit is there. Do we follow it? You know, we're not, we're not going to be able to maintain balance in our lives if we do not follow after the example of Jesus Christ, who was the personification of balance. And that's something that you know, we need to explain to our friends and our neighbors. If we're really their friends, we'll tell them these things. They may not want to hear them, but if we really care about them, we'll tell them these things. Well, number four, to achieve balance, you have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. Now, this is, you know, this, this is really starting to hit our society the fact that, you know, people don't like doctrine. Uh, it says, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. You know, we, we have in our society, you know, when I, was, when I was young and even before then, generally speaking, from what I can gather, the, the major issues of the day that related to religion was what they would call the pursuit of ecumenicalism. One church is as good as another, they would say. 
Well, they would say one denomination is as good as another. But the Church of Christ is not a denomination. And that's what Churches of Christ are saying. Let's get back to following the doctrine of Christ, not the creeds of men. But you know what? Our society is, is getting worse. It's moved away, you know, moving on down the road from ecumenicalism. And now it's following this thing called pluralism. And pluralism isn't just the idea that one denomination is good as another, but it's looking at the world array of religions and saying all of them will get us to the Father or to God. But that's not what the New Testament teaches. That is clearly not what it's teaching. And that's one of the reasons why Christians are being sort of mocked right now in our society. And if people cannot get this back in balance, who knows where we'll go. And that's a pretty scary proposition. But a New Testament Christian, to achieve balance, has to abide in the doctrine of Christ. Now, some people say, well, the doctrine of Christ, what is that? What does that word doctrine mean? Every once in a while, I'll come across somebody who'll say, well, you know what, I don't want to hear anything about doctrine. I don't want to know anything about it. Well, the thing about doctrine, it just means teaching. It just means instruction. So when you say, I don't want to hear anything, I don't want to hear any of this doctrine, it's almost like saying, I just rather remain ignorant and not know. And you know what happens when people are ignorant of things? They end up being out of balance. And so it's important that we follow the teachings of Christ if we're going to maintain balance. Well, number five, to achieve balance, a New Testament Christian must run the race with endurance. There's a poster out there, uh, those motivation posters. I, I always like reading them, and I don't agree with all of them exactly, but I really enjoy them. But one of them, I, the first one I ever saw had this idea of success is a journey, not a destination. And I thought, wow, that's a really a great, that's a really a great message for a business. I, I saw it when I was working in industry. But I kept on thinking, you know, for a New Testament Christian, it's, success is not just the destination, but it's also the journey both. It, both of them are important. And you know, so we need to be mindful of that. And part of the problem that people have, that Christians have in maintaining balance is their range of vision is too short. They live their lives from the time that they have, you know, they, they go in their teen years and their adult years and they, and they live their lives and they go through and they do things. And then sometimes they may not even think about eternity until eternity is coming upon them. It would be better if we had longer vision we would be able to run the race with endurance if we knew how long the race actually was. It says, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And the next verse, which I didn't put up there, points right back to Jesus. But it's interesting that that cloud of witnesses, there are great examples of men and women of faith in the Bible. You read those things and those stories, like David and the, Goliath, and the giant Goliath, Moses leading the people out of Egyptian bondage, Jesus standing in the temple in front of his critics who are questioning him, and he's able to answer them and just handles the situation where they, you know, the people just follow him because they're like... <laughs> Well, he obviously knows what he's talking about. These others, the Sadducees, Pharisees, they don't know what they're talking about because Jesus is able to have the mastery over them. And so those witnesses that we can read ought to motivate us and encourage us and help us be in balance. Now, some people, I don't know what their problem is exactly, but they seem to not understand that. And they may chide that. But you know what? They'll go to a movie and see The Lion King or Bambi, or they may go see, you know, all those feel-good movies, and they'll come out of there and they'll say, oh, I just feel so much better. It was just so enriching. And, I, and, all that. and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Now, if you watch a movie or if you read a novel and this gives you this, this kind of, it impacts you that way, why would, why would it be so out of the ordinary for the Bible to do that? One of the things that I tell my children is that you know, the Bible has the best stories in the world because 
they are true. They're true. Elisha, in his confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, there was a man that walked this earth named Elisha. Great example for us. Do we even think about that? Let's go on to number six. Number six is remember the standard of judgment. We have those that think that we live in a non-judgmental society. Or at least they think that we do. Or think that we ought to. And the ironic thing about that is the more that they insist on tolerance, the more intolerant they become. And I don't know if they're ever going to realize that or not. You know, they keep saying you can have all these conflicting viewpoints and that we can be tolerant of one another. Well, you can't have contradictory things and treat them as if there's no contradiction. That's something that they need to come to terms with. You know, some people, you know, they, they want to say to Christians, you know, you are not allowed to judge me. Well, you know what? That statement is a judgment. And that's something that I guess that, you know, they're, they're pretty emphatic about it, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that they are making judgment when they say that. Obviously, they're, you know, they're also misinterpreting what Jesus was saying when they say those kinds of things. Because Jesus definitely tells us that we must render righteous judgment. Now, we might not like this. Some people may not like the idea that we're going to be held accountable to, to a standard, and that standard is not within ourselves. It's external. You know, some people say, well, I have the truth in my heart, and that's why I follow. I follow my heart. Well, you, you may follow your heart, but you're going to be judged by the Word of God. You're going to be judged by Jesus. Jesus says this in John chapter 12, 47 through 48. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Now, you know, when you think about that and you look at those words I underlined there, some people don't like that. But it doesn't change the reality of it. Just because somebody doesn't like it doesn't mean it's not true. And so we plead with people, you know, you need to follow the scriptures. You know, some people are excellent at contract law. I worked for a, a person who was, you know, they were interested in contract law. And one time I asked them, you know, have you read the New Testament? And the answer was not, sort of vague. And they didn't want to say no. They read some of it. And, and they appreciated it. But I point out to them that the New Testament is a contract. It is a covenant. It is a law. I mean, the idea of testament ought to tell people that. We sign documents called the last will and testament of whoever the person is. A will. as a testament we're going to be judged by the contents of that New Testament. We ought to at least read it, know what's in there, need to follow it, need to obey it. You know, the world, they have, you know, they have all kinds of standards, they have all kinds of beliefs, and, and it's everywhere. I mean, it's just, there's so much of that out there. There's all kinds of isms. You know, it's, it's no wonder that relativism is having such a field day today because there's so many out there. People are like, I have, you know, I have no idea or I don't have time or I don't want to take time to try to figure out which one of these isms is correct. So I'm just going to do whatever I want. And that's what they do. But you know what? We need to, we need to do our homework. We need to make sure we're following the New Testament. I always sort of liked it. Uh, There's a preacher that lived back you know, before the Civil War uh, named Alexander Campbell. He coined this phrase. He would talk about different isms. And he said, we don't talk about, you know, we're not following isms except for New Testament-ism. That's the phrase he would use, New Testament-ism. You see, we have to follow the New Testament. That testament, that will, is the will of Christ. Christ died for us. He established it. We are immersed, we are added to that covenant, we're added to the church. 
He's going to judge us by that. Now, some people say, well, you know what? He says he didn't come uh, to condemn the world. Well, I was listening to a sermon, and the, the person made an excellent point. They said that Jesus, when he came, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And the person pointed out that when Jesus came, you know, at the incarnation and, and in, the man, you know, in the manger and, and he walked among us and all that, he didn't come to condemn because the world was already condemned. That's why he came. That's why he laid his life down. That's why he sacrificed his life for us. That's why he gave us the words of life so that we could have that abundant life. Some people, they don't, you know, they don't seem to get that. Jesus came to save our lives, and, and not just the lives, the existence we have here on earth. He's interested in all lives. He's interested in all souls. And so when we talk about you know, the idea that a New Testament Christian remembers the standard of judgment, they remember the Lord has bought them redeemed them from sin, that they could have this eternal life. You know, some people, maybe it's a distinction that maybe you need to think about. When we die and Jesus comes again, everybody, every soul will have eternal existence. But only those found in Christ, living today, found in Christ, have the opportunity the blessings, the reward of not just eternal existence, but eternal life. Eternal life. See, a New Testament Christian remembers the judgment that they're going to be held accountable to that standard. So when we close this up to achieve balance, let's just sort of review these points again for a moment. The New Testament Christian to achieve balance does not substitute different weights. He recognizes that he is going to be proven, he is going to be weighed in accordance to the Word of God. He also, in order to achieve balance, knows that Jesus is the personification of balance. He is our example. He taught us in word and he taught us in deed. And we need to follow him if we want to have balance. New Testament Christian to achieve balance has to walk in the light as Jesus is in the light. Christians are not perfect, they're being perfected. They're being perfected because of the sacrifice of Christ. You come in contact with the blood of Christ when you are baptized into Him. But that blood, as you walk in the life, it continually cleanses you of sin. You know, you might think that you're the only one out there on that rope, but you're not. You're not. Well, to achieve balance, the New Testament Christian abides in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Not the teachings of Muhammad, not the teachings of Joseph Smith, not the teachings of Karl Marx, not the teachings of other men, but the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And then to achieve balance, number five, they know they have to run the race with endurance. You know, being a Christian, running the Christian race, some people think it's a sprint, but it's really a marathon. You're going to have to work up the endurance. And you need to come to that realization or you are always going to be out of balance. So you need to remember. Also, finally, remember the standard of judgment. You know, you don't have to go through life wondering, what am I going to be held accountable for? What, what does God want from me? If I just knew what God wanted, I would do it. Well, you know what? God told you. God has told you in his word. You can read it and you can know. And you can follow it and you can do it. You, you know, you can have balance in your life. But you know what? You'll never have balance, real balance, without God and without Jesus Christ. Thanks for watching our program today. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey. Yeah.